Good evening and welcome to Borough Hall. My name is Diana Reina and I'm the Deputy Brooklyn Borough President. Thank you for your patience. There are six items on this agenda this evening. Please note that this hearing is being recorded to comply with the public law for transparency. It will be available for viewing on Borough President Adams' website, brooklyn-usa.org, or on the One Brooklyn channel on YouTube. Again, web viewers may submit timely comments to askeric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov for Borough President Adams' consideration. Please call the first item and let us begin. Calendar item number 116006PQK. This application by the Administration for Children's Services and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, other known as DCAS, for the acquisition of property located at 343 Warren Street in the Borough Borum Hill neighborhood of Community District 2. Such action would facilitate the continued use of the property as a leased child care center. Community Board 2 waived its opportunity to review this application on July 10th, 2017. Would Allison Grant, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Good evening. Is this, we're good? Hello, my name is Allison Grant. I am the Chief of Staff at the ACS Division of Early Care and Education. It's so good to see you all too. of you. Um, I'm here tonight, as the Deputy Borough President said, in, to state ACS's favor of continuing this space as a daycare center at 343 Warren Street in CB2. Um, as you may know, this space is designed, designed specifically as uh, for use as a child care program, which means that it's very specialized with classrooms and bathrooms for young children and multi-purpose spaces. There's also a rooftop playground, um, which is built with materials specifically for young children. Uh, the program that is currently there um, that is contracted with ACS for services is Sunset Bay Community Services. It, the name of the program is the Warren Street Center. This is our early learn program, which means we use uh, state child care block grant dollars to provide subsidized child care to ch young children under the age of five. The families are um, low income and they have to um, be determined, determined eligible for care, which means that they earn less than 200% of the poverty level and also have a reason for care, meaning that they're working. Um, thank you. <laughs> they are working um, in an educational or vocational program. Um, or perhaps they are looking for work, which is allowable for up to six months with eligibility, or they are homeless, um, which is their reason for care. They don't need to be working or otherwise, which is something that we added in January, which we're very happy to have brought in that category. Uh, so I will just say that this is a child care program. Um, there are a total of 69 seats that we contract with, which are 55 seats for children three and four, which includes early learn pre-K seats, and 14 seats for toddlers, which are primarily two-year-olds um, in our category. So with that, I would be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Ms. Grant. I just wanted to uh, express how Borough President Adams and I appreciate the unlikelihood lease renewals had been uh, coming before us in previous years where there were less than what would be five-year leases. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing what would be uh, an improvement of those yes. leases considering uh, the borough's expansion um, of what would be development and the uh, safeguard network that we have to provide for these uh, services mm -hmm. if the city does not secure them for long-term leases we may find it much more difficult to find space um, and so what is the term lease for this particular center yes Thank you, and I know we've discussed this before, and, and you know the city under the mayor's uh, current administration has definitely had a directive to have longer leases, and this is one of them. This is a 10-year lease, and we're very happy that we're moving in that direction. Um, we agree that the shorter leases are not our goal, and 10 years is definitely a move in the right direction. So we, we're glad you agree. And so previous, uh, we've seen 20-year terms um, which were the city's practice. Mm -hmm. um, and although those were continuous leases with very little oversight on the landlord for improvements, mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that we continue to push what would be uh, 
terms of renewal that allows the city to check in with the landlord to make improvements um, and securing what would be long-term mm -hmm. with those lease renewals in place. Is that also considered as part of this lease uh, my beyond the 10 years? Yeah. My understanding from DCAS is that there is no renewal option on mm -hmm. this lease, um, which I'm sorry to have to convey. Um, but I know that there is a standard processes by DCAS to start engaging a landlord two years before uh, a lease is expired to um, make sure that they can have conversations and continue the lease as long as possible. Um, and of course, you know, ACS as the user of the space, we have ongoing landlord management. So we always are in communication with the landlord um, and DCAS is our negotiator, so. And this is a standalone space? That's my understanding, yes. And does the, and I respect the fact that there's ongoing conversations mm -hmm. um, to secure what would be uh, positive discussions moving forward. Um, is there a provision in the lease uh, to cover the city for the right of first refusal? Sorry, I had to confirm my colleagues. I don't believe there is a right of first refusal um, in this lease, but I will say that DCAS has been doing a pretty wide net um, looking at all of the leases to see and approaching landlords saying, you know, we would like this even if it's not an official legal provision. We want you to know the city is always interested. If you are going to sell, we would like to know first, even though you legally are not bound to tell us, but we would like to know because we would like to have an opportunity to bid. So the city is definitely moving in that direction. And so for the sake of clear communications, our office is looking to mm -hmm. seek what is that language in okay. this particular lease renewal um, upon expiration or otherwise to protect the city's investment, mm -hmm. the right of first refusal. I'll ask DCAS and I'll get back to your staff. We appreciate that. Um, we just recently celebrated what was the acquisition of a site, Swinging 60s, um, mm -hmm. in Williamsburg and that was very difficult. Yeah. Uh, money invested and uh, almost lost, losing the institution itself, oh, wow. both seniors and uh, child care services were going to be displaced, um, but we're happy to report that that particular center was uh, saved, acquired, and will continue to service the community, and now it's community owned, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to uh, what was going to be a displacement of all services and development of God only knows what and the right of first refusal was not enacted upon, which was hmm. the mistake of the city, and yeah. we don't want to revisit situations like that. So I wanted to just express okay. um, our gratitude in this uh, avenue where we're exploring greater emphasis on the right of first refusal and yeah. acting upon that particular uh, language so that we protect the city's investment in the future. Thank you. Uh, part of Borough President Adams' uh, vision for Brooklyn includes beautification of our streets while addressing best stormwater management practices. This location is uh, in the Gowanus Canal storm drainage area with street runoff hampering efforts to clean up the canal's water quality. So we just, we're just interested in understanding what are some of the considerations that have been given to incorporating or requesting from the landlord participation in or sister agencies uh, to streetscape improvements to existing features, mm -hmm. uh, such as adding an awning above the uh, entrance with the signage. Uh, there's, I believe I recall no signage, or, or maybe a small sign we couldn't see mm -hmm. um, as far as the frontage of the building is concerned. So there's real no, no real visibility uh, in identifying the location mm -hmm. as a daycare center providing services. Um, so we'd like that to be rectified. Okay. Um, adding a street bench as part of the city bench initiative and expanding the tree pits to advance best stormwater management practices through utilization of the bioswell program. Okay. Um, I will follow up and look into all of these as well. I appreciate it very much. And last, I just wanted to express our interest um, as far as Borough President Adams' policy to maximize job opportunities for Brooklyn Knights uh, with local businesses hiring or apprenticeship opportunities as they arise, how does the daycare center go about filling those opportunities? Uh, what's best, what steps might be taken in the future to promote locally based 
hiring. So for instance, New York City uh, hi Hire NYC mm -hmm. as a program that's uh, publicly accessible um, or other methods uh, to be able, through the MWBE participation uh, program, to be able to utilize through the SBS department um, are some examples of whether or not the daycare center is uh, taking advantage of in a local economy. Mm -hmm. We definitely are um, prioritizing that as well. And um, ACS is not directly involved in the um, hiring at the program, though of course we help provide guidance around what level teachers and certifications they need to have um, high quality childcare. Um, we do connect the daycare council, which is a citywide mm -hmm. um, organization that you're mm -hmm. familiar with, um, with all of our early learn programs to ensure that they're able to post their um, vacancies because they have a job list serve mm -hmm. and um, they have a, a grant in which they work specifically to connect um, currently unemployed daycare staff with vacancies such as a program like this. So we um, help facilitate with that relationship. And so if anyone watching this particular program uh, they would have to go through the daycare council yes. in order for their job list serve. They could go directly to a program as well, um, but we would recommend that anyone who's currently looking for a position to go to the daycare council website. Um, if they have any questions, they have a contact number on their website and they'd be happy to guide you through anything that they might need. Thank you very much. I appreciate the testimony, the update, mm -hmm. and further follow-up on the matters that were discussed here today. Great. Um, we appreciate your attendance, and do we have any testimony? Speakers? So speakers? You yes. For, you want to call this Are there any speakers that have signed up this evening for this particular application? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. It's Ms. good Grant. to see you. It's great to see you. I appreciate your patience. We're going to move on to calendar item number two. Calendar item two, 170454 ZMK, 170455 ZRK, 170456 HAK, and 170457 ZSK. These applications by the Department of Housing and Preservation and Development is for a zoning map amendment that would change an R6 district to an R72 district with a C23 commercial overlay on the north side of Livonia Avenue at Howard uh, Avenue. The disposition of city-owned property and a special permit to allow the use of community facility floor area for community facility uses with sleeping accommodations. These actions would facilitate the construction of an eight-story mixed-use building that will provide approximately one 125 affordable housing units, ground floor, retail, and or community facility space. Community, community Board 16 voted to approve this application on June 27, 2017. Would Jocelyn Torrio, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Good evening. My name is Jocelyn Torrio, and I work at Brooklyn, in the Brooklyn Planning Unit at New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. With me presenting tonight are David Beer, Vice President of Breaking Ground, and Andrew McIntyre, Associate at Robert A.M. Stern Architects. We are here tonight to present Edwin's Place, an eight-story building that will include 125 affordable housing units, one unit for the superintendent, retail and community facility uses on the ground floor and space for the delivery of on-site supportive services. Um, this is the agenda for tonight's presentation. I will first provide an overview of the ULRP act application and the proposed actions. David will then provide an, a brief overview of the history of the project, um, as well as an overview of Breaking Ground and African American Planning Commission. He'll discuss um, the project site and site context, the proposed program, 
Um, Andrew McIntyre will present the renderings and green features of the project and we'll end with the timeline. Um, after the timeline, we'll have time for questions. Um, other members of our team are also here. Um, Matthew Okabe from the CEO of African American Planning Commission, as well as representatives from our Division of Special Needs Housing. These are our, the proposed actions that are put forward in the ULRP application for Edwin's Place. HPD is the applicant for this application. The ULRP application is um, the first. The ULRP application has several actions, including UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition of city-owned land, a zoning map amendment from R6 to R72 with a C23 commercial overlay, a special permit to allow the maximum allowable community facility floor area ratio to apply to the proposed nonprofit institution with sleeping accommodations, a zoning text amendment to map a mandatory inclusionary housing area. Since this proposed project is used group three, a nonprofit institution with sleeping accommodations, MIH does not apply to this proposed project. HPD is supportive of the project as it'll transform a vacant 20,000 square foot city owned lot. The proposed actions will maximize the amount of affordable units at the site with 125 units. The actions will also um, activate Livonia Avenue by, by providing ground floor retail or community faci facility space. Now David Beer will provide an overview of Breaking Ground and African American Planning Commission. Thank you. Good evening, my name is David Beer from Breaking Ground. Um, Breaking Ground, uh, formerly known as Common Ground until about a year ago, is a developer an operator of affordable and supportive housing. We operate about 3,500 units of affordable and supportive housing in Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, upstate New York, and Connecticut. And um, we previously developed two affordable projects in uh, Community Board 16 near the Edwins Place site. Our co-sponsor and co-developer is African American Planning Commission, um, they are a housing social service community and economic development organization operating in central Brooklyn. Their mission is to break the cycle of domestic violence, HIV AIDS transmission, homelessness and poverty. They operate a 40 unit transitional residence in Brooklyn for families whose heads, head of household is a survivor of domestic violence. So Breaking Ground and African American Planning Commission first engaged Community Board 16 about the project in 2015. And since then, we have uh, made some changes and modifications to the uh, proposed program uh, through a dialogue with Community Board 16. Um, Early this year in January, they issued a letter of support for the project, and uh, just last month they uh, recommended approval of the ULERP application. Breaking Ground and African American Planning Commission met with uh, borough president staff in May of 2016, and uh, the staff made a suggestion about creating three income tiers of affordability, which we've incorporated into our uh, project plan. This is the uh, project site, the uh, yellow rectangle on Livonia Avenue. Uh, the cross streets are Grafton Street and Howard Avenue. Uh, the site is adjacent to the number two elevated uh, two train tracks uh, and is two blocks away from the Saratoga Avenue train stop. Um, and will there be a tenant education process on passive house principles uh, so that the air exchange is fulfilled so that there is as close as possible to zero air exchange, um, which is part of the passive house design principle? Do you to the education of residents? Or do you um, yes, we will educate residents um, regarding 
um, the passive house qualities in the building. Um, we will be doing commissioning. We, we plan to apply for an ICERTA funding, which will require uh, commissioning of the building systems. And we'll, we will also um, uh, comply with Enterprise Green Communities standards. And so the needs, uh, the energy performance assessment for uh, the exchange, air exchange, uh, to be as minimal as possible, is that something that you're going to be requesting from the council or do they even do that? The assessment, the energy performance as assessment. Uh, so an energy performance assessment might be done by an independent commissioning agent. Um, and so it would be a, third, a neutral third party who would analyze the, um, and commission the building in terms of the energy usage post-construction. We're not hearing. Sorry. <laughs> so have to be right up against it, sorry. Um, we would probably contract a third party independent assessor to analyze the energy usage of the building post construction as part of commissioning as, as David mentioned. And so you will do that or you would have to do that? Uh, we would have to do that as part of the NYSERDA credits. Uh, so that would be, yes. And that's part of the NYSERDA funding that you're referring to? Yes. yes. Fantastic. I just wanted to understand those layers um, to capture the value of your efforts here so that it can, can continue in a very sustainable, permanent way. And for both low-income and supportive housing units, what is the qualifying income range for prospective tenants and what are and the anticipated rents for each unit type? You already went through that as far as the chart is concerned. How long are these units required to be rented at affordable rates as far as permanent affordable housing? Um, we will sign a regulatory agreement with the city that will have a term of 60 years. Okay. Could you elaborate on what would determine the extent that the ground floor on Livonia Avenue fronting spaces would be used for retail as opposed to community facility use and whether consideration would be given towards accommodating local merchants and or nonprofits such as arts and culture, which the community has been calling for uh, within uh, spaces in the Brownsville area. Uh, so this particular square footage is a total of what? 3,000 square feet. And uh, we, we have not identified a tenant. Um, we do intend to work with the community to identify some uh, local merchants or not-for-profit groups that uh, need space. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, HPD recently facilitated uh, the Brownsville uh, plan working with uh, mm -hmm. local residents and stakeholders and some of the uh, retail uh, priorities were financial services or a bank branch or a gym or fitness center so those would be the types of retail uses we might look for. And on the, in the community facility side, as you mentioned, arts or culture mm -hmm. um, organizations would be uh, something that we would find desirable, as would after school programs. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking off the top of my head, uh, with no favoritism one way or another, it's just uh, Made in Brownsville is an organization mm -hmm. uh, working with businesses uh, you have Arts East New York, uh, you have uh, just many different arts and culture organizations seeking what would be spaces. Is this space going to be considered as part of a condominium commercial unit? No, it will not be a condominium. It will be owned by the entity that owns the residential space mm -hmm. as well. And as far as the common spaces, as well as the rooftop, uh, you know, the opportunity to see Green Roof Incorporated, the Solar Panel Incorporated, uh, Fitness Room Incorporated, all that funding was possible through city and state dollars? 
Yes, it, uh, the project will be financed both by city and state so, um, sources. And so per unit is having what type of subsidy? How much of a subsidy? Per, per unit, mm -hmm. what is the subsidy? Mm -hmm. um, uh, off the top of my head, I would say that the, the city subsidy is $75,000. Oh, thank you. The city subsidy is about $75,000 mm -hmm. a unit. Um, the state subsidy is about $150,000 a unit. Um, we, the city is also uh, contributing project-based Section 8s for all the supportive units. So um, those residents will only pay 30% of whatever their income is. Okay. What type of supportive services do you plan to have on site for families and individuals and do they only apply for or to the residents? Is it also part of the services extended to the public at large? I'm going to ask uh, Matthew Okabi to uh, come up. Matthew is the CEO of African American Planning Commission and uh, African American Planning Commission is the service provider for the project as Thank well as our co-developer. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Matthew Okabi. I am the CEO of African American Planning Commission. Um, we are going to be the um, service providers at Edwin's Place. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing we did was develop linkages with a host of community-based organizations to provide services off-site mm -hmm. and on-site. Um, services will be made available to all the tenants of supportive housing mm -hmm. and non-supportive housing. Okay. So everybody in the building will have access to services. Um, services will also be made available to those people from the community who do not necessarily live within the building. For example, um, we have linked with Wall Street um, firms who will provide financial literacy classes to those in the community and to tenants of the, of the building. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the clarity and the direct service provided to not just the in-house residents, but also mm -hmm. what is a linkage to the general public right. of the community. Um, and the design and elements that have been incorporated for a dignified development that provides uh, what is a higher bar to reach as far as supportive housing is concerned. So my compliments to the partnership. Um, I wanted to just express Borough President Adams' uh, is concerned that rents based on household earnings, nearly 60% of the area median income, would disqualify too many Brownsville seniors that are rent burdened or at risk of displacement. The funding you had referred to regarding the Section 8 based, do you believe that that will address in the process of uh, assessing applications where seniors on fixed incomes could be captured as part of uh, those that may be at risk of displacement um, because they're not going to meet the requirement as uh, you have laid out once you start processing applications. Well, the Section 8, um, the project-based Section 8 assistance will only be for the supportive units. Um, in order to serve a lower uh, income tier of local residents, we did create a 40% AMI band. Mm -hmm. And for example, for a studio, I, I, right there. For a studio, uh, at the 40% AMI band, the rent would be 
dollars, which would be affordable to many seniors. And so the 40% income, the 40% AMI bracket for a studio for a senior on a fixed income, if they are below the 18,000 mark, because they only receive Social Security, the Section 8 voucher will not apply. That's correct. Okay. Will there be funding mechanisms mixed into the financing that would make it possible to reduce rents to make them more in line with households at the percentage that we were just referring to, uh, for example, should income, income in Congress adopt uh, legislation permitting income averaging for tax credit financing, would that assist your project without delay? Uh, yes, it would if, if, if that were to be enacted by Congress. Income averaging for tax credit purposes would mm -hmm enable us to um, reach a lower income tier. Mm -hmm. And given the community concerns regarding displacement and the prevalence of rent burden households, could you please identify what marketing strategies will be used in the tenant selection process in order to ensure the highest level of participation from Brownsville community? So for instance, Community Board 16 having community preference at what percentage um, through the lottery base and what organization will be doing the actual marketing of the application and any technical assistance to fill out the application, um, especially those that are rent burden or at risk of displacement. Uh, with the marketing strategy staff start off with a financial literacy campaign just to address what would be credit issues um, in the neighborhood to start uh, making sure that those hurdles that prevent what would be uh, qualifying applicants uh, to successfully apply for this particular development uh, become eligible in a way that begins uh, prior to the marketing. Um, so the marketing, uh, Breaking Ground will do be the marketing and leasing agent for the project as well as the property manager. And um, we will advertise the uh, project um, to potential applicants through local publications, through the um, local electeds, and through the community board. Mm -hmm. We do plan to work with the community board to hold a series of workshops for applicants. Um, the HPD is also has implemented a housing ambassadors program where they, where they partner with local not-for-profits who can actually offer uh, assistance to applicants in completing applications and, and uh, applying through the lottery for affordable apartments. And do you know who those housing ambassadors are? There are, there are probably a dozen mm -hmm. in, in Brooklyn. Um, but you haven't, you haven't identified those that will work with you. No, we haven't done that yet. It. But that is the intent, to yes, identify who you're going to be working with to provide what is a lottery eligible um, workshop so that applicants are ready once the application is out. That's correct. Borough President Adams' policy to promote the use of sustainable and renewable energy resources um, in advancing what is a sustainable future for Brooklyn, the retention practices for stormwater runoff has been addressed in your design, correct? Yes, with the green roof, yes. And the trees that you demonstrated in your image, is, are those bioswells? We will be studying bioswales uh, for the street tree plantings. Mm -hmm. um, the open space to the north of the building is, uh, will function as a uh, stormwater retention system as well with a cistern attached to delay the uh, stormwater from reaching the, the 
city system. And can you, can you show us on the image yeah. and point to it so that we understand? Right, so, so two systems. The uh, street trees, which are in the foreground of this image, would function, we would study bioswales for those locations. And then I'm going to jump to the plan because we don't have an image of it, but the open space to the north uh, would function as well as a stormwater retention system. And, and again, on the roof, the green roof would function similarly as well. Mm -hmm. And their corner spaces. Uh, yes, uh, where it says green roof. Sorry, the laser pointer doesn't work on here. But the um, it, along the perimeter of the roof. Mm -hmm. And the capacity of the solar panels, as far as production of energy, supplies how much? Are you off the grid with the production? Uh, Do you anticipate? I don't anticipate we'll be entirely off the grid. Um, we'll have to study it further to understand mm -hmm. the exact percentage. Uh, our hope is that we can supplement the building's energy needs at a substantial rate, but uh, we'll have to see exactly what technology can provide. Mm -hmm. And is there a generator that would, uh, some type of storage capacity? Uh, yes, there would be limited storage capacity uh, as part of this system. Um, again, in this mechanical penthouse that's labeled bulkhead to mm -hmm. the left, um, there's limited capacity. Again, depending on how the system is designed, we are hoping to maximize the functionality of this system. Mm -hmm. And is there, um, I believe you mentioned there was going to be a laundromat room? Uh, yes, that's correct. And who is the vendor for the laundromat? We, we have not selected a, a vendor yet. Will that be a MWBE? We would certainly request or um, a search f to include MWBE. We, that, we, that would certainly be something we'd aspire to. Fantastic. So the inclusion and participation of MWBE and local businesses in the process of construction and ongoing procurement opportunities, um, how do you foresee uh, addressing what are those two particular goals? So um, as I mentioned before, the city and the state are providing financing for the project. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the state requires the general contractor to, um, to hire 32% uh, th of the total contract value um, to, to use, to utilize MWEs. And uh, the city, for its financing, requires 25%. So I want to thank everyone for being here explaining this particular application. Uh, we will move forward. Uh, if there's nothing else you'd like to share this evening, uh, we will ask for the public uh, portion of this particular application. Uh, there is a, is this the speaker? Yeah. You could have a seat, I'm, I apologize. Dr. Geron Geronimo C. Williamson, President of the Children Global Science Fair Committee Incorporated. Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. John C. Williamson. Good evening. I'm a special investigator of number one, the place of worship to protect our place of worship under the order of NYPD. And uh, we have been investigating HPD from day one that they were born all the way up to now. Uh, and it has come to our attention that they are just about the most powerfulest entity out here in construction and and they're doing their work and improving the community 
we found out that the places of worship, that they uh, take the whole block, and then they make promises to these places of worship, and they are not keeping their promise. That's number one. And our job is to make sure that the people in that neighborhood is relocated properly. properly. And that has not been happening. And to give you an idea of the dangers of construction, the sewer line is one of the most dangerous uh, part of construction on the planet, let alone in Brooklyn, New York. And what's been happening is that we found out that they are building some buildings and they have fresh air vents at sidewalk level, which fresh air vent has been a violation since 1968. No fresh air vents at sidewalk level. All fresh air vents must end at rooftop. And people come with their baby carriage and park their baby carriage right in front of the fresh air vent, getting infected, which caused massive retardation. And we have more mentally handicapped children in the history now than we had during the so-called caveman era. So there's too many errors being made. But the main thing is that our organization, me, myself, and I, that's a veteran, a war hero out of Vietnam, has suffered unbelievable uh, among the uh, proceedings that the HPD has been doing in construction work in our community, not keeping a promise, never make a deal out of the court without it being written proof with HPD because they've been having a problem on keeping their word. Uh, I, out of the, which I'm the pastor of the Creators Educational Crusade, New Hope Missionary, a member of Mount Sinai Baptist Church, and volunteered to live in the shelter to find out the things in there, which is horrified under veterans' condition. Uh, I won the largest court case in the history of America. HPD never paid the bill, okay? And the money I gave to the community, to the veterans, the police department, the planning board, and uh, on and on. And the bill was never paid. Index number 691 slash 85. Okay. Uh, CPLR section 108 was totally violated. And they, they had, to, yes. Thank you very much. Yes. But the main, the main thing is this. I'm watching these construction sites. And they've been approved. And I have people in the EPA, the Environmental yes. Protection Agency. So we're to this we know all of their projects, OK? This so, but this one, this one in general involving Brownsville, Bedford Stuyvesant, mm -hmm. OK? Dr. Is, Williamson, we have to get through five okay. more applications. OK, I just want to make it. Plain to you. That they came before planning you, board you number three. You made it three. crystal clear, not okay. just plain. Planning board number mm -hmm. three, we said, don't go make another move in our neighborhood until you pay the bills. Okay. Okay. I and appreciate you your testimony. As a major entity in this, mm -hmm. to please make sure, do a past record on them, because there's even organized crime involved in this too much in New York. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate you your testimony. Much. And I send you blessing that you'll get it straight no matter which way you go. Bless you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. At this moment, I'd like to just make sure that there's no one else for this particular application uh, as far as speakers are concerned. Did you sign your speaker slip? Can you please do that right now? Okay. So we're going to give you a, a speaker slip, but you're going to testify first. We'll give it to you afterwards. And just state your name. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Carolyn Benjamin Smith. I'm the Chief of Staff for Council Member Mealy. I was asking um, the proprietors of Edwin's Place um, who are the, or, or have you reached out to the council members in community board to present this to them? In community board 16? So if, if we can have 
David at least come up to the podium uh, just to refer to that question. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, we met with uh, Council Member Mealy's staff in 2016 and um, uh, followed up um, earlier this year, um, but were unsuccessful in getting a meeting scheduled. Okay. So, on record today, I would, um, after I speak, I would like to um, exchange information mm -hmm. because the Council Member is aware what she's saying just like he just confirmed, another meeting needs to take place for us to be more informed as to the latest developments of, of this project so that we could all be on equal footing and understanding. All right? Thank you very Thank you, much. Ma Our regards to Council Member Mealy. Most definitely. Thank you so much. At, at this time, Mr. Dr. Willis, no. Oh, you left something there? Can you get it, you know, so that he can receive it? Don't trouble yourself. We'll get it for you. I'd like to make sure that we have no other speakers for this calendar item. Calendar item number 3170430ZMK and 170431ZR. These applications submitted by Canyon Sterling Emerald LLC seek zoning map and text amendments to facilitate the development of a vacant block at Linden Boulevard in the East New York section of Community District 5. The zoning map amendment would change the existing R4 district to, com to com combination of R8A, R7A, and R6A districts with a, C with a C2-4 overlay along Linden Boulevard. The zoning text amendment would designate the block as a mandatory inclusionary housing area. The proposed development will consist of 521 affordable housing units with 30% of the residential floor area designated as permanently affordable to household incomes at an average of 80% of area median income. In addition, there would be retail and community facilities use and a 100 accessory parking spaces on site. Community Board 5 voted to approve this application on June 28, 2017. Would Steven Sinacori, the representative of this application, please state your name and for the record and present this application. And you're not Steve, so <laughs> please. Good evening, my name is Lisa Orantia oh, and I'm a colleague of Steve Sinacori at Ackerman LLP, the land use attorneys for the applicant, Canyon Sterling Emerald LLC. Uh, with me today are Dan Rad and Carolyn Kenzia from Radson Development, representing the developer, um, and Rachel Simpson from Magnuson Architecture and Planning LLC for the project ar architect. The application is for a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment um, in connection with the proposed development of the vacant block 4496. You see it on the upper right corner. Um, the block is currently zoned R4 with a C12 overlay measuring 100 feet deep from Linden Boulevard to the north. Uh, the two actions needed to allow the development of four new buildings containing residential, commercial, and community facility uses um, are for a zoning map amendment to change to R8A with a C24 overlay 100 feet deep from Linden Boulevard and R7A, 100 feet deep from Loring Avenue to the south, and the remainder of the block to be rezoned to R6A. Uh, the zoning text amendment will designate the area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area. The proposed development will consist of residential, retail, and community facility uses with 100 accessory parking spaces. All of the 521 residential units will be affordable pursuant to a regulatory agreement with HPD and HDC with 30% of the residential floor area, about 157 dwelling units designated as permanently affordable to households at an average of 80% of area median income. The benefits to the community will be the provision of much needed affordable housing, commercial and community facility amenities, and the proposal is uh, 
for construction design that will be consistent with the surrounding development. Uh, the site is, will be composed of four tax lots. It's 100,000 square feet in lot area. Uh, Linden Boulevard to the north is 170 feet wide. Loring Avenue fronts the property to, to the south, and it's got a width of 70 feet. And Emerald uh, Street on the west and Amber Street on the right have widths of 60 feet. Um, so the proposed development will include um, approximately 413,000 square feet of residential floor area. This is, again, a total of 521 dwelling units, about 17,000 square feet of commercial floor area, um, about, uh, about 21,000 square feet of community facility floor area, and accessory parking for 100 cars. Building 1 um, is proposed to be a 12-story building. It will contain 235 dwelling units. The first floor will have commercial retail floor area and space for parking on the first floor. Building two is a proposed eight-story building with 109 dwelling units. The ground floor will contain community uh, facility use and again, floor area for parking. Building three is a proposed nine-story building. Uh, it will contain 77 dwelling units. The ground floor will contain community facility use. And finally, building four is an eight-story building with 100 dwelling units, and the ground floor will contain uh, floor space for parking. So just the floor plans in case you have questions for the architect. Here's a, a rendering of the building. Um, the applicant is seeking financing for the proposed 100% affordable housing development under HPD's Our Space Initiative, uh, mixed income program, mix and match, um, extremely low and low income affordability program. Um, 157 dwelling units will be designated as affordable um, pursuant to MIH option two. Thank you very much. Regarding the intended affordable housing units, what is the qualifying income range for prospective households based on household size is the first question. Carolyn, do you want to? Carolyn Kenzia uh, is from Rats and Development representing the developer. Hi, I'm Carolyn. Um, so right now we have these, uh, the project set under mix and match and ELLA term sheets. Um, for example, building one, we have income brackets of 27% AMI, 37% AMI, 47%, 57%, 80, and, and 80 is the highest. Um, we don't anticipate going above 90 in any of the buildings. And so this is speaking to the 30% permanent affordable housing or to all 500, all, five, all 521 units. And then as far as the 30% permanent affordable units, these particular AMIs are also applicable. Correct. And it will be a range, the permanent, the 30 percent permanently affordable will be distributed among those income brackets. So it will be a range of income brackets that will be included in the 30 percent. So how many units will be reserved for at 27 percent of AMI? 
Um, that I don't know yet. We haven't done the distribu distribution across the whole building. Um, and there's no set requirement in terms of how many are at 27%. It's, it would be based on, I think, I'm sorry, we're doing this at the 30% weighted at 60% of AMI. 80%. So we, we're doing MIH option two on the project, mm -hmm. which means that the 30% have to have a weighted average of 80% AMI. So because they're all at 80, we, w we wouldn't do all of the units at 80%. So how many would be at 80% versus 27%? I can't, it would depend on the math to get that weighted average of 80% based on the square footage. It's, it's a ratio of gross square footage to income level. Um, and it, it pans out when you do the math, so. And who will finalize those numbers? The, we would finalize them and HPD has to approve them. So I just wanna make sure that the record reflects that HPD will uh, work towards what would be a spread of right. number of units distribution according to each AMI. Right. And that is we can't the do, blended model. It has to be seek. blended. Mm -hmm. We can't do all at 80. It would have to be blended in order to get approval by HPD. What are the anticipated rents based on the number of bedrooms? And what is the distribution of units by bedroom size? Okay, so right now, uh, let me start with the uh, bedroom distribution. Mm -hmm. Right now we have, I just wanna make sure I'm giving you the right information. We have um, 30 per, 37 studios, so that's six, Right, this is just building one, because that, right now that's the only building I can give you accurate information for. Studios are 37, mm -hmm. um, with 16 per, that's 16 percent. One bedrooms are 99, which is 42 percent of the building. Two bedrooms are 76, which is 32 percent. And three bedrooms are 22, which is 9 percent of the building. And then there's one supers unit, which will be a two bedroom. So the, how many two bedroom apartments? 76. And how many three bedroom? 22. And, and this is just for the first building. And what is the percentage of the one bedroom? 99, and it's 42%. How long are the non-MIH units required to be rented at affordable rates? So that's going to be um, subject to whatever regulatory agreement we work out with HPD. We haven't done that yet. Usually it's a minimum of 35 years, but we're, we're, that's going to be determined by HPD and HDC once we finalize our negotiations with them. And so I'd imagine that the generous request for a zoning in this area to be considered would lend an opportunity to seek what is beyond the 30 year right. regulatory I'm, requirement. Right, and I'm sure that that's what will end up coming out of those, that's what we've seen happen with HPD. So we're, we're open to that discussion with HPD going forward. Given community concerns regarding displacement and the prevalence of rent burdened households, could you please identify what marketing strategies, such as designating one of, this, one of the community affordable housing nonprofits uh, as the affordable housing administering agent, will be identified for the tenant selection process in order to ensure the highest level of participation? And uh, what is the uh, technical assistance that will be provided to prepare lottery eligible applicants prior to marketing. 
Uh, we have not identified a nonprofit to work with yet, but we're very open to that, and we will work with the community to do so. Uh, our lottery is usually administered by our the property manager, mm -hmm. who also we have not selected yet for this project. Um, but we are, you know, we're very open to working with the community to put in place uh, assistance for filling out the application, um, navigating the website. I know that that can be very difficult for applicants. Um, so we're, you know, we're eager to find someone. And if you have any suggestions or um, know someone we could speak to who could help us with that, that would be excellent. So there's many nonprofits uh, within the community board and surrounding that community board uh, that I would suggest that you contact the community, local community board mm -hmm. uh, district manager to get uh, what would be introductions to those nonprofits to assist uh, with the identification of uh, appropriate partnerships uh, that could help yeah. with what is the technical assistance for lottery eligibility as well as uh, what would be marketing uh, partnership. Yeah, we'd be happy to do that. We have a good relationship with the community board at mm -hmm. this point because we presented to them several times. Mm -hmm. um, they gave their approval for the project mm -hmm. um, about a month ago now. And we've already talked to some of the members about working on the project in other capacities. So we'd be happy, we'll get in contact with uh, the district manager, Ms. Perkins, over mm -hmm. there. And I that appreciate set up. that. And so just to stress the point of uh, starting off prior to marketing the application, just the financial literacy campaign point uh, to assist the residents in preparation, mm -hmm. uh, because that is where uh, there is a gap between those that become eligible and those that are not, uh, where there may be financial constraints based on credit history mm -hmm. uh, that are very simple issues that could be resolved mm -hmm. but not at the time of a, a reviewing what is an already uh, very strict application right. and so we want to make sure that we're preventing that okay. from happening okay thank you we'll we'll definitely mm -hmm. look into that because we agree with you that that mm -hmm. this site's location and size of the proposed retail space make it a fresh eligible zoning did was this application considered for what would be fresh zoning so uh, a while ago we had thought about doing a supermarket here but we determined it wouldn't work there's not enough demand at the moment because there's a food town right across linden boulevard um, and also the project doesn't benefit from any of the fresh benefits so it, Be because of the zoning that you're trying to acquire correct so this would not be complementary. It would give you the same. Correct. Yeah, we're not getting any additional um, zoning benefits. So uh, we determined that at this point in the project, a grocery store is not a good fit. Um, Could like, I just you know, understand that? What is the demand for a grocery store? Well, we again, this is based on the fact that there's a food town directly across Linden Boulevard. If I walk down Court Street right now, I'll show you 10 different supermarkets. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure people understand. When we talk about, uh, what's my friend down here? Thank you, Trader Joe's, mm -hmm. which I, when I was a council member, tried to get mm -hmm. in the neighborhood of Bushwick. They also said the same thing. We don't meet the demand of, um, the opportunities of seeing what is supermarkets entering neighborhoods uh, seems to be driven by what are a numbers game that tend to not be applicable when there's multiple uh, six-figure incomes in neighborhoods like downtown Brooklyn uh, with less density as opposed to a neighborhood like Community Board 5, which probably has more density adjacent to what would be 
even more neighborhoods with higher density. So I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, I think, I mean, we're happy to revisit it. We mm -hmm. haven't ruled it out. Again, it was something we looked at initially. We just have heard that the food town has not seen a lot of traffic at the moment. So if- Perhaps they don't have a good business model or fresh produce. Right, so, so we're happy to explore it further. I would appreciate that and you know, hopefully you can reach out to uh, what are options like Trader Joe's, mm -hmm. uh, who conveniently is going to be opening up another store just around the corner from here. Um, okay. So I don't. Aldi's food is very affordable. Aldi's food is also very affordable, which is another option. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Wegmans is going to be opening in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Right. Uh, I'm sure they're interested in opening up further east. Uh, but these are all uh, supermarket options that I would find. Uh, bring what is the competitive edge for Food Town to mm -hmm. up their game as well. Understood. We'll definitely look into it. I appreciate that. What steps is the applicant prepared to take in order to connect local nonprofits to the available, available commercial ground floor space for community facility use? And is the community facility or commercial ground floor going to be a commercial condo space? Um, could, what do you mean by commercial condo space? Because I heard this question earlier, and I, I just want to understand what you sure. mean by that. So the commercial space, uh, you said how much of the commercial space is? There's 17,000, that's retail, and 21 community facility right now. So 17,000 square feet of commercial space. Let's say Trader Joe's decides, yeah, sure, we want to come in but we want to own our own space. Right, okay, so no, it would not be a condo in that sense where we would be selling it to um, another owner. It would be owned by the same entity or an affiliate, a single purpose entity that's associated with the, t the owner. It um, is only tenant. It's only a lease, lease correct. It's only, all those spaces are only for lease. And so I ask because uh, the community facility use the same is applicable where a condo commercial lease could provide what is a permanency of uh, not-for-profit uh, like alter arts and culture which are always being displaced. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, organizations that provide the social services uh, that don't uh, have the opportunity to uh, seek permanency um, and you know for instance a daycare Mm -hmm. where the daycare leases are up every five, ten years, uh, then as the neighborhood continues to grow and higher demands for um, being displaced is the end result because they didn't own, we're trying to mitigate what are opportunities for commercial condo uh, on the community facility use side as well as small business side. Okay. Um. Yeah, so we, we will not be condoing and selling any of those spaces, but we, um, in terms of leasing, we like leases that are, um, you know, we don't like turnover either. We like, we like tenants to stay in our building. So as long as it's a tenant who can um, put down roots there and is a, you know, is a good tenant, then we're happy to um, work out a way to keep them there for an indefinite amount of time. Borough President Adams' policy to promote the use of sustainable and renewable energy resources focused on advancing a sustainable future in Brooklyn. I wanted to understand what are some of your practices to retain stormwater runoff mm -hmm. as one area. So I'll answer briefly, and then if I'm not answering enough, our architect can jump in and, and give more information. Um, the building has several green roofs right now, mm -hmm. so that is one area. Um, Rachel, maybe if you want to come up, and I think you'll do a better job of going in depth on the stormwater retention. Thank you very okay. much. And just introduce yourself. Sure. My name is Rachel Simpson. I'm with Magnuson Architecture and Planning. 
Um, in terms of stormwater on this site, as if you're familiar with the area, you'll know that the Amber Street is uh, often quite um, overcome with stormwater, and so we're really concerned I'd with that. I'd love for you to <laughs> meet what would be the Loring Estates homeowners, who will speak very specific to those issues. Sure. So we're, uh, we're working to develop a strategy to mitigate um, our stormwater from uh, affecting that and to help uh, reduce any of the stormwater coming from our site uh, around. So we've got a number of green roofs. 60% um, of our roofs, I believe, right now are green roofs. Um, we're also looking into... 60% of the rooftop, the rooftop will area. be green roof. As designed right now, approximately, that's what's working out with our stormwater numbers. Um, so we're also looking into using those green roofs as blue roofs in some way to help capture temporarily, hold and release slowly the water that's uh, accumulating on those roofs during storm events. Um, that will help mitigate the on-site detention that we need to do underground. So blue roof would be the 40%? Or no, it's, 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 it's in the same spot the as green the green roof, roof. correct, yes. Um, and I'm just gonna go back to one of these slides here so that you can see how much green is actually on top of those roofs. So um, all of the green areas here on this side are intended as green roofs to, to capture and, and hold the stormwater. We do have some underground stormwater detention that's underneath the parking, mm -hmm. um, but we're trying to minimize that through these natural green roofs and blue roofs. Does that cover? And second to what would be the sustainable practices, uh, what other methods of uh, sustainable measures are you going to be considering for this design, such as passive house design, solar panels, wind turbines, uh, permeable pavers, and or bioswales, which I noticed are not incorporated into what would be the schematics? Correct. Our um, civil engineers were looking into bioswales, which I believe in their discussions with, um, we're not certain whether that would be um, appropriate considering the groundwater level here. I think the drainage requirements with the soils weren't right for the area there. Um, in terms of additional sustainability feature, oh, I'm sorry, determined by whom? Um, in looking at the soils um, with, yes. Uh, Say your name again so that way the record can reflect. Sorry, I'm Carolyn Kenzia. Uh, determined by our civil engineer. We have, um, we had engaged uh, AKRF engineering on this project very early on to assess all of the um, surrounding area, the, the stormwater issues, the drainage issues, and uh, it just, we determined that the bioswales wouldn't, wouldn't be appropriate here because of that. I'm, I'm trying to follow what you're saying. Your civil engineer determined that bioswales are not feasible in and around this development because the soil is the soil can't absorb the water appropriately. Because um, it's uh, clay? Uh, correct. Okay. Yes. And so that raises more concern well, for development being built out on this property. Certainly. So that's um, one of the strategies that we've taken. Because much of the property is uh, covered by a roof, that's why we've taken uh, steps to make sure that much of it is green roof to prevent which would be haven to prevent the water from uh, running off the site. How much of that property footprint has been um, tested as far as pilings are concerned for understanding how much clay is underground? That's currently ongoing right now. So um, that's undetermined. Correct. Okay. Because if the actual property itself, as far as the footprint is concerned, determines that 50% of it is clay. Mm -hmm. Then the civil engineer could go back and say, 
we actually now knowing this assessment after the pilings are concerned, we can always dig out the clay where the tree pits are to create these bioswells because it meets what would be less than 50% of the property footprint is actually uh, not permeable because of the clay. Yes, once we've gotten more information from our um, site investigations, we can um, look more at to the bioswale along the street. Mm -hmm. um, yes. If it's, it's Carolyn Kenzie again. Thank you. If is determined, you know, that's possible, then we'll reassess and, and definitely look into putting them in. Yeah, and as far as other sustainability options go, um, right now the project is going to be Enterprise Green certified uh, with the potential for LEED Silver certification. And we are also doing passive house elements um, similar to the, uh, to the earlier presentation. Um, we're, we're implementing much of the passive house principles while um, certifying through Enterprise Green. So, and so can you just tell me some of the passive house principles that would be incorporated? Sure, do you wanna? This is Rachel Simpson again. Um, some of the passive house strategies that we're looking at in design are a super insulated building envelope, so extra insulation at the windows and the roof. Um, what type of windows? So we have uh, triple paned glazed windows, very high performing um, UPVC windows. Um, we're uh, also looking at a very tight um, air barrier membrane to make sure that the heat that we put into the building stays there. Um, we have high efficiency um, mechanical systems uh, to reduce our energy usage, lighting fixtures, same as that, um, all in keeping with the um, enterprise green communities um, as well. Are, I'm sorry, I just wanna ask Rachel, are you a cert, uh, Passive House certified architect? Personally, I am not. We do have um, an architect in our office who is certified, and we have um, another who is working towards that as well that we have as excellent references and resources. Who have overseen these Passive House principle? Correct, and we have ongoing um, education in our office to talk about this. It's, a, it's been an ongoing conversation in the office for a while now. Mm -hmm. And as far as on the ground, uh, guarantee of construction at the passive house level, will there be someone on site uh, for monitoring of what would be the high efficiency uh, construction trade needs to meet the passive house design? The tightness, the... Yeah, yes, we, um, this is Carolyn. Uh, we have engaged with an energy consultant already um, who's started doing the energy mo modeling for the building and who, as part of their uh, work with us, will be meeting during construction with our team to be sure that the design is being implemented according to uh, the plans that have been you know, drawn, designed for the Passive House principles. So. Um, Similarly, we, we have to do the commissioning, um, make sure everything's beyond a certain level of the energy code, um, and they will do all of that. And what is the name of the energy consultant? They're Bright Power. Bright Power. And they have a track record for Passive House? Um, well, yes, Passive House, I think it's, it's becoming since this is a newer concept for everyone uh, right it's now. It's not new, technically. We right. Just, the U.S. did a poor job implementing <laughs> it. I think, especially yes. Especially in New York City. There, I think, um, similarly to most developers in, in the area, they are um, coming on board very quickly with passive house mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. so. And they do have, they have worked with passive house projects before, so they mm -hmm. do have experience. And as far as borough, President's, borough President Adams' policy to maximize good quality jobs, 
uh, here in Brooklyn for Brooklyn Nights. Could you please outline some of the steps that will be ensured for the participation and inclusion of MWBEs and local business enterprises in the process of construction and post-construction? So we um, actually also were very involved in our company has a general contracting arm who builds the projects. So we, in doing that, um, are overseeing the hiring of all the subcontractors and we hire, we bid out to MWBEs. We work with a lot of MWBEs already on our projects. We're always growing that roster and we're always happy to work with MWBEs whenever possible. Um, we also, in addition to that, will hire from the local community uh, for our um, on-site construction jobs directly employed by us. Um, we've already spoken to community uh, groups. Uh, we had some in our office. We had a group of um, gentlemen in our office, I think last week, to talk about how they can be of service in providing local um, local residents who can work on the project. We also have talked to the... And they're part of an organization? Um, they're part of the community board. It's a member of the community board who... Okay. Uh, land use committee. He's on the land use committee who okay. works, yes. We also have spoken to the community board about possibly using a local management group, if that's available to us. Um, they're going to suggest possible management groups we could use um, in terms of local staffing after the project is completed. Mm -hmm. And as far as tracking your commitments as far as MWBE local enterprises, uh, do you have what is a tracking administrator for this or will you be that tracking administrator? Um, it often is me personally, but we actually have some other, we've, we've, we've added some staff members who are working on that. Um, more on the construction side because it's a little bit easier that way. Um, on this project, we will likely have an ICAP tax abatement, which requires um, MWBE, very strict MWBE compliance filings. So that's, since most of our prior projects have had ICAPs, that's sort of the model we use for tracking. So it's the first time we're hearing ICAP being used. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it will be interesting just to see end of the year reports on ICAP in reference to what would be uh, MWBE, mm -hmm. uh, local participation mm -hmm. on behalf of the city of New York. Um, so I appreciate how this is being incorporated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm happy to, you know, if, if talk about how the ICAP compliance works. It's very extensive. You have to reach out to three different MWBEs for every single trade on the project. I'm familiar. I just never heard it incorporated mm -hmm. into a develop housing development. Yes. Um, and so I'm going to be following this closely to see the success. We've done it on... Uh, one project that we own and two others that we're building, and so far it's been fairly successful. Mm -hmm. we've, we've engaged with several MWBs. Excellent. So at this time, thank you to the development team. Um, I'd like to just request uh, the member of the public, Natalie Stewart, from the Loring Estates Development Just want to take a moment to thank everyone for their patience. These public hearings are very important to us and I don't like to rush and I respect your time um, and I hope you respect each other's time as well. Uh, good evening, good evening. Madam uh, Deputy Borough President. Uh, my name is uh, Tara Chester and I am representing uh, Loring Estate uh, residents and uh, the surrounding communities and we do have some residents who are in the audience today mm -hmm. and we also have some names mm -hmm. that are in the form of, of a petition because we absolutely um, oppose the rezoning and the construction of these four buildings because of mainly because of the magnitude 
the area is very congested. And I know there's been a lot of mention of you know, commercial space and um, it may sound very good, but we do have a lot of businesses in the neighborhood. We have businesses to the north of us, to the east of us, to the west, west of us. And then um, the parking, it would affect the parking of our tenants. Already there's a problem with parking. And then to have a 12-story building in, our, in that little space, it sounds big, but it's very little, because you have our um, development, and then there's another one next to us, and it's very congested. And to have such a big project, we don't see it as something that is advantageous to our community. Uh, first of all, um, we don't understand. It will really increase traffic. Um, like I stated, uh, parking will be affected. Um, this project is located in the 75th precinct, um, it will, which is known to be one of the busiest precincts. And um, how would that, that will put stress on policing and then um, sanitation. And then we're concerned about the effect it will have on our properties. And we have other questions. And another thing, um, no one has met with you know, uh, the members of Loring Estates about this. And, um, you know, we just don't see how this will uh, affect us. And another thing, the school systems. And there's so many other things that, why not build a school there? You know, um, that will it'll put a stress on the schools in our community. There's actually only one school in the neighborhood, which is a high school. They're in the community board? In that particular right, that's neighborhood. that's not the community board. Okay. So that we were just here to, um, you know, place our complaints and let you know that we definitely uh, oppose the construction of this and huge, and the rezoning this huge development in our neighborhood. Are you part of the homeowners associate? Thank you very much, Ms. Chester. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, are you part of the homeowners association one or two? Both. We are one and two. So Ms. Chester belongs to, two. and you belong to one. Um, and so there's a pending conversation we have that I'm still waiting for your answer on yes. that I haven't forgotten. Uh, yes. Speaker's privilege to just deal with some un, resolved matters, um, so I hope that that particular uh, conversation, okay, we'll get back to you. I'm still waiting. Okay. okay? Okay. I don't know if you know, so I know. get okay. her to update you. <laughs> Not a problem. Fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. And I appreciate you raising the education piece. Um, we're mm -hmm. going to look into what would be an education seat analysis. Uh, we usually do that. We did not do that for this particular development, so we'll go back um, and understand what is the uh, number of seats that are available uh, as far as the community board by primary seats, middle school seats, and high school seats, um, and understanding that the pressure of education as development continues to uh, rise that so does the uh, need to provide uh, education seats for those families uh, so often get left uh, behind or are not considered, um, especially because it's a standalone application. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we are not waiting for uh, an opportunity where we cannot accommodate seats but actually taking a look at whether or not there is sufficient uh, seats available in schools within the community board and the school district. And which school district is this? Is it 19? Yes, I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. District 19. And also the project only has Speak into the mic and introduce yourself. I'm Natalie Stewart. The project only has 100 parking for 521 units. Where are the other, where are the homeowners gonna park? Mm -hmm. When we already have 
people blocking our driveways because mm -hmm. there's no parking in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That's something that needs to be looked into. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And so if there are no other speakers for this application, we will move forward. Calendar item number 4170025ZMK 170026ZRK. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Richard Lobel. I'm from the law firm of Sheldon Lobel PC, joined by Frank St. Jacques of my office. And we're here today for the 70, 723 to 733 Myrtle Avenue rezoning. We're also joined by Mark and Scott Fishman, who are the owners of the property, as well as Valentino Pompeo, who is the project architect. They're here? They are here. Mm -hmm. Hi. Saying hi. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, next slide. So the rezoning here is along Myrtle Avenue. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sure. Go. This is when I know I'm losing my focus. Uh, we were supposed to call the item, and so calendar oh. item four, Richard, please. No, we call that. We're I did, call, okay. These applications submitted by JMS Realty Corp seek zoning map and zoning text amendments for block, for two block fronts on the north side of Myrtle Avenue between Woolworth Street and Nostrand Avenue, and one block front on the south side of Myrtle Avenue between Sanford Street and Nostrand Avenue in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Community Board 3. The zoning map amendment would rezone the existing M1-1 district on the north side of Myrtle Avenue to an R7D slash C2-4 district and the M1-2 district on the south side of Myrtle Avenue to an R6A dash slash C2 dash four district. The zoning text amendment would designate the rezoning area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area. Such applications would facilitate the development of an eight story 75 unit mixed residential commercial and community facility building with an affordable housing set aside of 19 permanently affordable housing units. Community board three voted to approve this application on June 26, 2017, but has not officially submitted recommendations. Now, you can certainly represent yourself. Uh, state your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Deputy Bureau President. Again, my name is Richard Lobel from the law firm of Sheldon Lobel PC. I'm joined by Frank St. Jacques of my office. I'm with Mark and Scott Fishman, the owners of the property, as well as Valentino Pompeo, the project architect. And the application is, as was mentioned, a rezoning in Community Board 3. Uh, the rezoning area, as can be seen on the map to my left, is along two blocks on Myrtle Avenue. On the north side of Myrtle, between Walworth and Nostrand, an M11 district would be changed to an R7D district with a C24 commercial overlay. And to the south side of Myrtle Avenue, between Sanford and Nostrand, to an R6A with a C24 overlay, and that's from an M12 district. There would also be a corresponding zoning text amendment of Appendix F to the resolution to uh, provide mandatory inclusionary housing with both options one and options two available within the project area. Um, the rezoning mirrors the Bedford-Stuyvesant North rezoning, which was uh, accomplished by the Department of City Planning in 2012, and as you can kind of see to the right of the circle on the map, there was an R70 C24 district, which was mapped for four blocks along Myrtle Avenue. And so when uh, Mark and Scott initially spoke to us about this project, the discussion was that there was an M11 and M12 district along Myrtle here, but that both the existing development as well as what would be beneficial to the area would be better reflected by extending that R70 C24 district. And so um, you can see from the green area the existing R70 C24, and in the red area the proposed rezoning area. This simply extends the existing R70 C24 district and really mirrors many of the 
uh, goals set forth by the City Planning Commission in its report on that rezoning. The land use in the area along Myrtle is reflective of a, of a mixed use district. Um, you can see that in the actual area of the rezoning, there are primarily vacant lots, which uh, to the extent that the rezoning was approved would uh, be able to be, uh, to be uh, uh, now produce uh, mixed use development with commercial community facility and residential development, as well as uh, existing zoning uh, really being not well placed in the R68 proposed district because right now all of the uh, properties on that block front on the south side of Myrtle Avenue within the rezoning area are resident, mixed use residential and commercial so all of them are non-conforming under the current zoning if the proposed zoning is approved they would all become conforming uses so it's something which is uh, seen as very desirable for the area and could it, you point where sure. you're talking about Frank you want to just point so the, this area uh, on the, which would be rezoning the south side of Myrtle between Sanford and Nostrand Avenue uh, is currently an M12 district permitting only commercial and manufacturing uses. Despite the fact that all of those lots that are fronting that section of Myrtle Avenue have existing ground floor commercial with residential above. So this rezoning benefits them. And that pre-existed? Yes. Since what year? Since, at a minimum, I imagine 1961, when they would have been grandfathered. And so the R6A did not grandfather? The, there was an existing M12. The, the, uh, the development predated the imposition of manufacturing, so those were long-standing mixed-use residential and commercial districts. But that manufacturing zoning has existed there for, for years. And so I'm trying to understand the non-conforming properties are residential above, commercial Correct. first floors in the R6A, or is that your proposed R6A? It's a proposed R6A. Okay. And are any of those property owners present? Those property owners, I would understand, would probably not be present. And in fact, the, the owner of the properties in question of the development site, which you can see in red on that block to the left, doesn't own any properties on that frontage. In essence, what they're doing in the, in the course of this rezoning is benefiting all of those owners by giving them conforming uses within that district. Have they been notified? They've, they've all received notification as per the community board. So there have been three land use meetings. There've been, there's been a full board meeting. So whatever the notification would have been for those community board, uh, community board residents at that time, they would have been notified. And so you're depending on what would be the community board notification not because the applicant has done due diligence to go and knock on those property owners. Correct. Doors. I mean, other than, the, other than some outreach which the owners have engaged in just by being local area business owners, because they do own property within the area. Where? Uh, uh, do you want to just point, Frank? I think there's a, uh, across the street, the, in the number three, the blue. Right there, to the right. The blue he one said to the right. Yeah, the to the blue? right. Huh? The blue. Correct. <laughs> Correct. It's okay. a commu community facility with uh, with a medical medical clinic. And so that particular property is not in the rezoning area. Correct. And so that's not being rezoned. Correct. Only the blocks that is highlighted within the dotted area. And was that particular designated area suggested by city planning? The, the uh, R7D C24 to the north of Myrtle Avenue was at the recommendation of the, of the applicant. So the applicant recommended the continuation of that R7D. At the request of city planning, we included the block to be rezoned R6A. This is again at the, at the cost and, and effort of the applicant. So, uh, so this was added to the rezoning at the request of city planning in order to allow for additional contextual zoning within that district. So the only existing zoning after the bed North rezoning is the R7D to the east along Myrtle Avenue. Correct. If you could just point. Right, so that's the only block. So you're... Well, actually, um, just to show you, the area in green 
was mm -hmm. the area that was rezoned to R7DC24. So that's, every, that's four blocks east of Nostrand. What public housing is that? Oh, it's uh, Marcy Housing. Mm -hmm. So, um, zoning map amendment here, and you can see just from the, the existing zoning versus the proposed, proposes an extension of that R7D C24 to the north and the R6A C24 to the south. Mm -hmm. uh, there's already existing R6A C24 zoning along that block to the south, so it's a, these are zoning districts which are contextual with the area. Uh, they're, they've previously been used in prior rezonings. Um, it's a fairly, you know, it's a, it's a district which permits uses which uh, city planning has, has stated that they'd like to see. They'd like to see activation of commercial along Myrtle Avenue here. They'd like to see residential, and of course, they'd like to see affordability, which is something that that project is proposing. Who's they? City planning. And that was per the city planning, the, the uh, city plan commission report issued uh, in conjunction with the Be uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant North rezoning. So why didn't they do it then? Well, it's a good question. I know some members are here and, and they can answer that, but I think probably what I would say is that many rezonings at the time that this, when these rezonings were accomplished were, uh, there were residential districts which were being rezoned to higher density residential districts and there were manufacturing districts. And I, was, I was part of that hearing. Right on the land use committee as a council member. And so I think that for city planning's purposes, many times uh, it's, it requires additional uh, studies and it's more costly to rezone a manufacturing property to a residential property given the additional environmental diligence that's required in an additional review. So I believe that in, in this case and in many other cases, city planning has expressed a preference for private owners to come in and to accomplish that rezoning given the fact that the community boards often want to see the zoning district but don't want to necessarily wait an additional two or three years while additional studies are being produced. And what is the number of businesses that are being displaced because of the zoning action? So there would actually be no businesses which would be directly displaced by the rezoning with the following qualification. So the development site itself, which consists of the five, blocks, uh, five lots that are highlighted in red, are actually all vacant sites which are currently used for truck parking. Uh, and in addition, the, as far as the commercial businesses are Who's concerned... Who's trucks? Uh, this, it's currently leased out for, for local area businesses that park mm -hmm. there. So uh, that's a business? Well, it's, it's more that um, local contractors and, and other businesses so utilize... it's more than one? More than one, from my understanding. So there's more than one business going to be displaced? Oh, it's, I'm sorry. It's, it's, a, it's actually a Penske truck rental site. Penske truck rental. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay, sure. So um, You could stand there if you'd like. I know it gets nervous. <laughs> so the additional commercial uses that are there wouldn't be displaced. In fact, the commercial uses would now be, uh, you know, would now be within conforming buildings as opposed to previously when those bu buildings were not necessarily conforming. Um, so the intention right now would be that n none of those buildings that are current, none of the buildings which contain those commercial uses would necessarily really need to be displaced because they would all be conforming. Mm -hmm. I apologize. I know that you were going sure. through the presentation. Of course. Um, so you could continue. Okay. So the blocks which we talked about as being rezoned are on Myrtle Avenue between Walworth and Nostrand uh, to the R7D and R6A districts with C24 uh, overlays. Um, this is just a uh, uh, eagle eye view of the development sites. And you can see the um, vacant portion so highlighted in green, which is a development site that's currently contemplated for the proposed building. And you can also see the, especially on the south side of Myrtle, many of the existing three-story buildings which uh, are non-conforming under the current zoning but would be conforming after the rezoning. Uh, these are just some views of the surrounding area. And then um, this is just kind of a, a summary of the proposed zoning district and its effects. Uh, the reason that the R7D C24 was chosen is that it responds to 
demand for new housing in the area. It allows for medium density apartment buildings with mandatory affordable housing. In this particular case, the proposed rezoning would result on the development site uh, with four, uh, 75 units of residential housing, of which 19 would be affordable housing. Um, the R7D C24 also requires active ground floor uses for commercial, um, which is one of the particularities of this zoning district. So it, in essence, provides for an activated uh, ground floor commercial corridor. Um, and again, as men was mentioned, it creates consistency with the existing R70 C24 along Myrtle, as was mapped uh, in the bed North rezoning. Um, this would strengthen the character of Myrtle Avenue as a retail corridor and would uh, enliven this Myrtle Avenue corridor, benefit businesses and the community by creating a more engaging pedestrian experience. This is the proposed development at the site. It's an eight-story building, again with 75 units, 19 of which would be permanently affordable, with, of course, a 50% preference for the local community board. Uh, the community, uh, the uh, building would maintain approximately 82,000 square feet uh, and be 90 feet in height. There would be 14,000 square feet of ground floor retail space, approximately 14,000 square feet of second floor medical office, and roughly 52,000 square feet of residential floor area. Uh, this would be inclusive of a 68 space cellar parking garage. And there is a rough breakdown of preliminary units, understanding that this is a rezoning, and so uh, the precise unit count is not a, is not a, uh, a factor that is set forth in particularity, but currently the, the proposed unit distribution would be roughly 27 studios, 45%, uh, I'm sorry, 45 one bedrooms, which would be 60% of the units, and then just a handful of two or three bedroom apartments. Uh, and then uh, we have the proposed building plans, and um, we're happy to answer Rich, any can you particular. Go back sure. to the unit distribution? Sure. So, basically 96% are studio and one bedroom apartments. Correct. You know, this was a conversation that we engaged in, particularly with the community board as we wound our way through what amounted to four hearings. Um, and there was a preference for smaller sized units within community board three. Uh, this is something which the applicant is flexible on. Of course, this being a rezoning and, and nothing being set with regards to particular building plans. Do you but recall the reason behind calling for 96 smaller units, 96% smaller units? By the applicant or by the community board? Community board. Um, uh, in all honesty, I believe that there's uh, consideration for local community members as far as um, what their preference is. And I think that there's, there's sometimes um, uh, some, there's some suspicion with regards to larger units. Uh, again, as a matter of public record, I was asked whether or not this was gonna be a development which catered to the Hasidic community, which many times looks to larger bedroom unit sizes. And on the record, I said this was not that, pro that type of project. This was not, you know, this is a project which would be marketed freely to members of the community. So that may have had something to do with the unit mix that was requested, but this was the unit mix that was discussed with the community board, and we did receive a, a, a vote in favor of 23 to five. But it's absent of two bedrooms in its entirety. Uh, with the exception of a handful, that's correct. And, and again, uh, this is something which we're happy to, to, to modify, right. um, but, but this, was, this was exactly what was set out to the community board. Did you finish your presentation? Uh, yes, I mean, we, we basically have the building plans, but, um, and we're happy to answer any particular questions, but, uh, as well as um, have the, uh, the owner with us as well, but um, that's, that's essentially the, pre the presentation. Okay, so I just wanna begin with, the affordable housing units, what is the qualifying income range for prospective households based on household size? as the first question. So um, I actually, have, uh, Frank has the particular uh, unit levels, uh, the income levels, and I'd have him address that question. Hi, I'm Frank Snijak with uh, Sheldon LaBelle. Yeah. Um, 
Deputy Borough President, we're, uh, we're looking at, at MIH option one for this project, uh, which would uh, require 25% of the residential floor area at an average of 60% AMI with one income band uh, at 40% AMI. Uh, it's at 10% re uh, of the residential floor area at 40% AMI. Um, with respect to uh, the 40% AMI income bands, that results in, and this is in um, a packet that we had sent to your office, mm -hmm. um, but in the 2017 AMI uh, income rent breakdown, uh, a family of one or a, a single at 40% AMI, uh, you're looking at a rent of about $668 a month. Uh, a family of two, again in 40% AMI, that's a rent of $764 a month. And a family of three, uh, is a rent of $859 a month. Um, if we jump up to 60% AMI for a, a, a single person, it's a rent of $1,000 a month or $1,002 a month. A uh, family of two is $1,146 a month. And a family of three is $1,289 a month. And so the, the family of three is your assumption that the family of three is going to occupy a three-bedroom? So uh, my understanding is, is that uh, no the, the, the bedroom sizes aren't specifically... Uh, I'm, I'm trying I, to understand. I, I understand. As part of your presentation, right. going back to what was the unit distribution, right. you mentioned what was 27 units are going to be studios, 45 one bedrooms, and three. Uh... Right, so it's, there's there's one two bedroom and, and two three bedrooms in, in the, 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 the one, preliminary uh, in unit distribution. Mm -hmm. Again, subject to, to change, uh, we understand the, the uh, borough president's comments with relating to unit size. Right. Um, my understanding is that a family of three could occupy a two-bedroom, um, and again, that's the with the rents at 40% AMI of 859, 60% AMI, 1,000. Right, we did. What are the anticipated? So you mentioned number of family, the family member uh, rent, prospective rent on, on household size. What is the anticipated rent based on the number of bedrooms? So I, I think that there's a correlation uh, a, a family of one would be in a studio. Um, a family of two could be in a one bedroom. A family of three could be in a uh, a two bedroom. Um, the the AMI rent breakdowns uh, are by family size, mm -hmm. and then they, they correlate back to to bedroom size. I, I haven't gone into to family of four because which would be at an AMI of uh, forty percent. That's a rent of nine hundred fifty four dollars. Um, Jumping to, to 60% AMI, that's a rent of $1,431. Um, a family of four would, would, uh, could occupy a three bedroom. Okay. Okay, and so in, as far as Borough President Adams and I trying to address what is a blended model of affordable housing, um, considering the need for uh, an integrated housing distribution. Um, you know, we're, we're concerned that the two bedroom is completely uh, absent of the model. And so we just wanna understand uh, your consideration for what would be a two bedroom component so that it's not taking away from the three bedroom but rather decreasing what is this studio and, and one bedroom percentage which dominates 
a distribution of units. Right. So, so I, I think the the uh, most of the focus on this project thus far has been on the the massing the floor plates. Mm -hmm. um, this unit mix, as we said, is is not set. Uh, the applicants are currently working with the architect to look into blocking some larger unit sizes. Mm -hmm. um, they they haven't uh, made a determination of what that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. As as you stated, this would result in less studios and more two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. um, that that would be the idea there to to reduce the the studios to result in uh, in, in more two bedrooms and, and maintain the one bedrooms to the degree possible given the, the, the floor plates. But there's a, it's a, a double loaded corridor for, um, you know, uh, five floors. So, so there's, there's certainly room to, uh, to rework those unit sizes into uh, larger units at the expense of studios. And, and ultimately there would be less units, but uh, a, a mix that was more uh, geared towards larger unit sizes. And I just want to understand, uh, as far as the studio and one bedroom distribution of bedroom sizes, uh, were you gearing towards the senior housing priority? I, I don't think that was that was part of the discussion. I, I think the the idea was to provide um, a, a mix uh, of units that was was just simply geared towards smaller unit sizes, but not a specific program. And how will you support what would be the number of units at the lower spectrum of the AMI? at 40%. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure so, I understand the question. So the, the rest of the units are going to be market rate. Correct. And so 19 are going to be permanent affordable housing? Correct, pursuant to the MIH program. And the regulatory agreement for that will be? Uh, so there's uh, the, the applicant um, would uh, be fully compliant with with MIH. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is is there's a uh, a binding agreement that those units would be permanently affordable. Um, as it stands right now, with with the mix being proposed today, that's that's about um, of those 19 permanently affordable units. That's about seven studios, 11 one bedrooms, uh, and one, I believe two bedroom or three bedroom. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that would work with that, that the percentage of that small number. So there's a, uh, an MIH requirement that the, uh, the affordable units be proportional to the market rate units, and mm -hmm. that's, that's represented in those numbers. And you mentioned 40% of AMI, correct? Correct, that's, that's one income band that's required as part of option one 25% of the residential floor area with an average of 60% AMI. But it doesn't have to be one at 40% and the rest at 60. It could be a blend between. Correct, and I, I'm, I'm fairly certain it's required to be. There's three income bands. Mm -hmm. They have to be less than 130% AMI. Uh, and average at 60% AMI for the three bands. So you've got, you definitely have one at 40, and then two others to arrive at an average of 60% of AMI. And those numbers haven't been established at this point. The applicant is working with Foresight Street Advisors, uh, an affordable housing consultant, to find the right mix, uh, not only for the affordable piece, but, but for the entirety of the development. Foresight Street is uh, the nonprofit. They are not the nonprofit. No. They are they're an affordable housing consultant. I, I'd be happy to talk about the, the nonprofit that they've selected. Can you do that? Sure. So uh, the applicant has uh, chosen Impact. Uh, we've provided a letter to the, the community board, which we also forwarded to, to your office. Um, but Impact, um, they've signed a contract and um, would would administer the um, the affordable housing program, including the the lottery and all of the um, uh, informational uh, push 
uh, the, the marketing, informational meetings and such, uh, which, are, which are outlined in a letter provided to your office. And does that include, but not limited to, the technical assistance prior to for lottery eligibility? I, I believe so. Um, so the part of the, the uh, impact services are the marketing, including the lottery, and identifying qualified applicants, uh, holding informational meetings uh, at a local venue. Um, actually, impact appeared at at, uh, at least I believe both of the community board meetings that we had uh, in CD3, um, and then uh, Impact would handle the advertising and mailings um, and the application process and selection of qualified tenants. And so the informational sessions could just be uh, very limited, minimum, unless there is a specific request for technical assistance. Um, so I just want to make sure that there is a safeguard clause added, that there is technical assistance provided prior to the lottery, prior to the marketing actually, uh, for lottery eligibility seminars. So that if there's a credit issue, that credit issues are dealt with, so that the community residents are able to meet the requirements upon the marketing application process. Understood. And, and part of the reason that the applicant chose to, to work with Impact mm -hmm. is, is, given their experience in the area, um, we'll make sure that, that we discuss the technical assistance piece uh, with them prior to uh, engaging them further in this process. I appreciate that very much. Given community concerns regarding displacement and the prevalence of rent burden households, could you please identify what marketing strategies such as you mentioned the nonprofit impact uh, as the housing administering agent, correct? That's correct. And they will also be the tenant selection process administrator? For, for the MIH units, um, and again, the, the part of their, their marketing would be mailing flyers to over 10,000 people in their database who've expressed interest in affordable apartments in CD3 and beyond, mm -hmm. mailings to all local po uh, political offices, community organizations, churches, mosques, tenant and block associations, community boards throughout uh, CD3 and surrounding neighborhoods of the project, arranging advertisements in local and citywide papers, Applications and brochures will also be available at marketing events as well as all Impact Brooklyn events. So apparently uh, Impact has fairs, workshops, and clinics. Uh, they'll also promote through social media, email lists, serves, blogs, and e-newsletters. And they'll coordinate with government agencies uh, for their own e-blast and posting on the agency's websites. And they this is, I'm sorry. Continue. I, I uh, it, they, they provide very, very comprehensive uh, right. uh, outreach services to, to ensure that these, uh, these units are, uh, the lottery process goes smooth and these, these units are, are leased up mm -hmm. uh, and compliant. Mm -hmm. And as far as impact is concerned, it, this is only applicable for the 19 units. Correct. And so what happens to the rest of the units as far as the market rate is concerned um, will the applicant work with impact to see if there's eligible individuals that meet what would be the market rate rents i i think that's entirely possible uh i, I don't know that that conversation has happened yet uh, but it will certainly ask the applicant to continue to be in touch uh with with impact to see uh, what services they'll be able to offer for the market rate units The site's location and size of the proposed retail space uh, make it so that it's fresh eligible. Was that applicable to this particular application? So yes, we, we are in a, the, the site is within a, a fresh uh, zoning bonus and tax incentives area. The applicant is, is actively seeking a supermarket tenant, but has not sought the, the fresh zoning incentives. 
um, at, the, at this point. Um, the tax incentives may be something that they choose to seek in the, in the future, uh, assuming that they, they have a supermarket tenant in place, but um, the applicants have, have identified that this would be an appropriate place. It's a, it's a large floor plate uh, with, with great street frontage, uh, and they, they've identified that there would be a need in the area for, for a supermarket, so they're, they're actively seeking a supermarket tenant. Um, and so the fresh zone bonuses are not added to this? They are not. So in, in the future, they're, they're not seeking the, the zoning bonuses. In the future, if they, if they were to, to seek that, that bonus, they would have to come back to city planning for certification uh, for that. But it's, it's not part of this project. It's not something that's under consideration now. I think the tax incentives are more attractive uh, uh, to the applicant based on conversations we've had internally. And so active seeking for a supermarket, was it part of a national search? I, I don't know the details of the search. I think that there's an, there's an interest. I, I don't think they've, they've started actively seeking tenants other than identifying that that would be an ideal tenant at this space. Could the applicant speak to this? I'm uh, Scott Fishman with JMS Realty. Thank you. Um, he, what he said is accurate. We, we've, uh, we've identified the space as good for a supermarket, but at this stage with the amount of time still before we get hope, what's hopeful approval on, on the Euler process, uh, we, we don't feel comfortable going out and actually actively marketing it, but when we get closer, we, we intend to. And how much is the square foot? It's, it's about 14,000 square feet. And based on the size of the residential lobby, it, it might be slightly smaller, but it, it 14 is, is safe. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Fishman, have you spoken or reached out to the National Supermarket Association? Uh, not, not, not at this time, no. Have you ever had any contact with them in no. the past? I have not. Do you know who they are? I'm not familiar with them. Okay. Um, so the National Supermarket Association are members of an association who are supermarket owners. Um, many of them are uh, MWBEs, and so uh, just trying to make sure that as you continue your discussions for what would be supermarket search, uh, that they are included as part of your list. Um, and I don't know if you are going to act actively pursue what would be uh, a Trader Joe's or an Aldi's, uh, but just making sure that there is an opportunity here uh, to secure a lease for fresh zone and uh, service the community at large, uh, considering the opportunity of such a large square footage, which is normally not uh, accessible in the neighborhood. And as far as this particular commercial storefront, is this a condo commercial space? It's, it's, it's a rental. Uh, we it's have no rental. plans to condo it. Uh, in terms of making a condo to sell it. So Correct, that the, as a space that, that's not for our small plan. business. Yeah. And the medical office is the community facility? On the second floor? Mm -hmm. Correct. And so that's giving you additional zoning bonus? Yeah none whatsoever no there's there's no bonus or there's no zoning benefit for locating the community facility on the the uh, second floor and so can i ask what is uh, what was the assessment used to provide what is medical facility as part of the community facility use medical offices as part of this development, which takes away from the residential units that could potentially be added to the footprint of this development. Right, so and I, I may have Scott speak more to this, uh, but they, uh, the applicant has, uh, has experience with, with other properties they own that uh, currently have uh, medical facility occupants that have expressed uh, need for, for more space in the area. So they think that they've, they've got a tenant base and they have experience with uh, medical office um, tenants uh, who could potentially 
use and benefit the community at this new building. And, and you're right in saying that the, the, uh, the, the footprint of the building, or ex the, the, the second floor of the building uh, would, would change. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily be as large um, because of, of yard requirements on the second floor. So while there would be more residential if the community facility were, uh, were eliminated from the second floor, it, it would be more akin to the, um, the upper floor, floor plates. Um, so it, it wouldn't necessarily be a, a, a straight trade of 14,000 square feet of, commercial, of community facility floor area. It would be about, um, I think we're at about 8,000 square feet. Of um, community? Of, of, of residential okay. uh, in exchange for that, that community right. facility floor area. So my land use expert next to me is expressing that you would not gain 8,000, but rather adding another floor when you eliminate the community facility gives you more space, not less. I, you're right. That's, that's, that's um, with, with respect to the, this, I'm sorry, I should have clarified. The, the second floor would have to be, uh, wouldn't be full coverage or nearly full coverage like the proposed second floor is. The building would, would need to be higher in order to accommodate uh, that floor area as, as residential floor area. And, and I apologize, I did, should have made that more clear. Mm -hmm. And so the medical facility has been the direction of how the second floor will be utilized as opposed to adding more height for more units, eliminating a community facility use. Correct. So, so the the building has proposed that the choice was, as, as there's no, no bonus uh, for providing community facility floor area, it was, it was simply a choice that um, there, there would be a market for uh, medical offices right. and they would provide a, a benefit to the community. So if Mr. Fishkin can just talk to me a little bit about the medical uh, office use, because I tend to see medical office space usually for the additional F FAR. In this case, you're not gaining anything, mm -hmm. but you know in your industry um, that there is a demand. And so I want to understand what is that demand? So uh, we, we've been operating in the area for, m my family's been in the area for 30, 40 years, you know, owning a meat, a meat warehouse. We converted it into actually uh, a medical facility with Kings County Hospital. It's across the street. It's that the blue property that we What's own. What's it called? It's um, Bedford Syverson Alcoholism Treatment Facility, mm -hmm. right on the corner of Myrtle and Walworth. Um, we also rent to several dialysis centers on Crown Heights in the Bronx, and um, we just feel very comfortable with that sort of tenant. Uh, so doing a development like this, we saw the floor plate, and just with our network of tenants and brokers, we felt it's something we could do, find the right mix for that, for that space. Uh, it wasn't really about getting additional FAR or anything like that, like you mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. and. So one of the issues that I know that we've found is the lack of appropriate health care services, such as a dentist, mm -hmm. uh, such as uh, what would be uh, examinations uh, that require what would be referrals to diagnostics. Um, I do hope that when you are going to consider what would be a tenant in the medical field, that it's appropriate for what is a need being met as opposed to just uh, an additional service being repeated. Um, just for the sake of providing additional benefits to the community. Absolutely. I yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. Uh, as far as Borough President Adams' policy to promote the use of sustainable and renewable energy resources, I just want to understand because I, I don't see what would be uh, visible to the naked eye, what is uh, promoting practices in retaining stormwater runoff, uh, any incorporation regarding sustainability in uh, NYSERDA, NIPA, solar panels, passive house design, wood turbines, blue, green, or white roof covering permeable pavers and or bioswell. So I'm hoping that that is something that I just don't see on the image, um, or is it just completely just left off the design? So 
the, the, to answer your question, the, the, the applicant is, is considering sustainability measures. Um, they're not there yet in this okay. design. Uh, it's still preliminary for, for them in terms of, uh, of the building design. As I mentioned, getting the massing right, getting the, the floor plates right has been the primary concern thus far. Um, the applicant has uh, started discussion with, with two uh, energy consultants mm -hmm. um, with the intention of retaining uh, one of them uh, prior to, uh, to, to construction and design on this project uh, to ensure that they can uh, identify the appropriate sustainability measures um, and, and work them into the project. Um, we do know that uh, the 2014 energy code and, and building code uh, have certain requirements. They'll certainly be compliant there. And their, their goal is to go beyond that. They just haven't identified specific measures yet. Um, they've just started these conversations with the consultants, have not retained one yet. Um, and if they're able to do so in, in a short period of time, identify specific measures, we'll be happy to, to provide that information in writing. We just don't have that at this point. Is the consultant Passive House certified? I, I don't know uh, if they have the Passive House certification. Uh, our office is, has worked on Passive House projects before. We're familiar with it, and, and we can help facilitate that discussion with, with consultants. Um, I do know that, that uh, we've, uh, we're, we're very aware of the borough president's policies uh, and uh, suggested measures as it relates mm -hmm. to sustainability. So the preliminary discussion that's, that's been had with the, the, um, uh, the, the consultants um, is relating to green, blue, white roofs, um, insulation, bioswales, stormwater retention. So a, a number of the items that, that you mentioned in your question mm -hmm. um, would be analyzed uh, for uh, whether or not they, they um, would be able to be um, worked into this project. And as far as Passive House Design, are you Passive House certified? You said your your company. Sorry, no, I'm, okay. I'm just I a lawyer. The, okay. our, our, our firm has worked with on other projects that, that were Passive House that right. came through ULERP. Um, so we we sort of peripherally aware of it, um, understand what it is and what to look for, right. and understand the, the, the borough president's uh, right. policy concerns regarding and, and push for Passive House. Right. So um, we've Pompeo had that discussion Architect, internally. Pompeo Architect, are they? Passive house? They are not. No. So, so that's that's part of the um, the, gap. the push for right. for getting a, a, a an expert um, consultant on mm -hmm. specifically as it relates to sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, the conversation has started. No one's been retained yet, uh, but there's two consultants that um, have have uh, given proposals uh, for their work going forward. Mm -hmm. And as far as the quality jobs uh, that we've continuously, consistently referred to. Um, could you please outline what steps would be taken to ensure the inclusion of participation of MWBEs and local business enterprises in the process of construction on site as well as post-construction? So at the, uh, the hearing with the Community Board 3, uh, the applicant is, is committed to MWBE and local hiring. At this point, they haven't identified a, a specific uh, percentage. Um, they're still working on working that out and figuring out what they can do uh, in terms of, of that commitment. The commitment's there. Um, they are working with, with Forsyth to see uh, if there's any programs uh, that they would be, um, programs such as um, with respect to financing that, that would include a mandatory MWBE requirement um, that they would, would participate in. Um, at this point, it's, it's still an open discussion. The commitment's there. Uh, we just don't have details to report at this point. Was ICAP as a program explored? Uh, it's part of the discussion with, with Forsyth. Uh, ICAP, um, I, and if the applicant were potentially move forward with a, an HPD financing program. Um, our understanding is that, is that there would be an MWBE, MWBE requirement there. Um, that discussion isn't, isn't complete yet. We're not sure if, if they'll move forward in that direction. Um, if they were to either use ICAP or another financing program, um, th there would be uh, MWBE there. 
Okay. And separate and aside from these uh, particular questions regarding MWBE local business enterprise, the impact of utility service in this area. I just happened to speak with uh, a local business, just so happens to be uh, yesterday on Woolworth. And their business uses what would be uh, a need for 220 amps where now they're operating at less than 200, which is impacting their business. Uh, there was a blowout of the transformer as well as the cables. Your development is going to be an additional added burden to what would be the utility services as far as energy is concerned. Um, making sure that this application is aware of all of that uh, because this designated area was primarily manufacturing. And there still exists what would be manufacturing um, industrial businesses in and around this area. Have you engaged, has the applicant engaged with the utility service company to understand uh, what type of energy supply would be required here in anticipation of this development without compromising what would be the rest of the energy usage on the block around the corner from it? I anticipate that that conversation has not happened yet. Um, point taken, though, I, I will certainly ask the, the applicants to look into uh, the potential impact uh, as it relates to the, the, the power supply. Um, but my understanding is that they have not had that conversation yet. I'm, I'm not sure if they're aware of the issue. Um, but I'll, I'll ask them to, to, um, to look into that I think you've been further. joined by someone behind you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Valentino Pompeo, the how architect. How are you? Good, how are you doing? Good. Um, typically, once we have certain unit, you know, unit counts set in place, we would submit a load letter to the utility company. Well, that's part of the yeah. problem here. Um, the company that I'm referring to is across mm -hmm. the street from what never actually were supposed to be residential units and today exist, as opposed to uh, seven years ago when they were just on their own generator, supplying their own energy. Uh, they never had a problem for 100 years on the property. Mm -hmm. Today, they have a problem because they went off their generator and completely went on the grid, not anticipating that across the street from them there was going to be residential units developed. Today, those units are compromising the energy supply for the business this will be an added burden as well. Okay. And so I am raising it now because I have to deal with what is this issue and I don't, wanna, I don't want this to be an afterthought. We, we can immediately engage our electrical engineer and that. we can send out a request to the local utility company. I would very much appreciate that. If you could CC our office, that would be helpful. Not a problem. Thank you very much. So I want to thank you for uh, this particular uh, testimony and application presentation. I'm going to move into the public section. Uh, I'm going to call Luis from 32BJ, SEIU. Luis, what is your last name? If you could present yourself at the podium. Actually, actually, Madam Deputy, Luis had to step out. Okay. I'm going to speak on this subject. Sure. If you can just introduce yourself. Um, good evening. My name is Hal Shaw. I'm a building service worker and a member of 32BJ SEIU. I am here testifying on behalf of my union. 32BJ is the largest property service workers union in the country. 32BJ represents 85,000 building service workers in New York City. Nearly 3,000 of us live in Community District 3, and over 35,000 of us work in residential buildings just like the one JMS Realty is proposing to develop. I am here to tell you just how important it is that JMS Realty commit to creating high-quality jobs 
at 723 to 733 Myrtle Avenue. 723 to 733 Myrtle Avenue is going to create badly needed affordable housing in Brooklyn. My union and I understand this, understand how important this is. Many of us have struggled to stay in New York City as rents have risen. But we also know we need good jobs, just as much as we need housing. As long as there are working people earning too little to afford rising housing costs, families are going to continue to get priced out of their homes. Building service, building service jobs can pay, um, can be jobs that pay only $10 per hour and provide no benefits. Or they can be good quality jobs. Um, that pay wages that allow people to afford to put a roof over their heads, save for retirement, and access health benefits. My union brothers and sisters and I have been able to stay in the city and support our families because we are lucky to have these kinds of jobs. We need to make sure that 723 to 733 Myrtle Avenue is creating good jobs not poverty jobs for Brooklyn residents. That's why I'm calling on the borough president to ensure that JMS Realty commits to creating high quality, family sustaining jobs at 723 to 733 Myrtle Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Shaw, you are, this is going to be the testimony for both you and Luis? Um, yes. Thank you. At this time, if there are no other uh, members of the public who will testify, I'm going to close this item. Mm -hmm.